Not bad, not bad, not bad. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Die Hard MMA Podcast. I'm your host as always, Clint McClain. This week we are headed to New Jersey. That's right, UFC Newark for a, I'll be completely honest, underwhelming card, even for diehards like us. There is not a whole lot to be excited about this week. (laughs) As usual, we are going to settle right in with our recap of last week's event and uh, just kind of go over the pros and cons, how we did. We'll try and keep that short. UFC 240 was a fun night and there was a decent bit to talk about. But once again, I do apologize. I was going to do another uh, full recap video for everybody. I actually think those are uh, relatively popular. I think you all like them Um, and I actually like doing them. So I'm going to try and do that more in the future. But my parents swooped on into town this weekend, so I had some unexpected guests, and because of that, I've had to basically spend all of my all of my free time handicapping this week's card. So I did not have time to put together a full recap video because otherwise the uh, the podcast for this week would have been late, and I didn't want to do that. So we'll cram them in here together. We'll go over last week's bets. We'll go over the card, and I know I made some people some money last week. So give me some skin air five i love hearing that we posted a positive here on the podcast for the picks and the numbers i'm very happy the direction that we're going in and best yet even though it was a small winning night we won ever so slightly more than we lost the week before so we are all good in the positive and i love it we got our night started with eric coke and that fight i could not have called any better Eric Koch came in at 170, and he looked phenomenal. He looked like a physical monster, and I love it. We were getting such a good line on him. He was the far better fighter, and even though I think he's going to have to kind of iron things out at 170, he's had a little bit of ring rust that was obvious from the get-go. He he had a good showing, and he got it done for us. We had even money plus 100, started the night off right. Then my girl Jillian Robertson, whoo, she took Froda out via TKO, ground and pound in round two. Now that was fun. You know, this card, it wasn't the best pay-per-view card. It wasn't the most exciting pay-per-view card, but it did have a phenomenal undercard as far as action was concerned. This whole card was very entertaining, I feel like, top to bottom. So even though it was kind of lacking in name value, it was really fun. I'm actually crossing my fingers for UFC Newark that it's going to be kind of the same situation because it's slim pickings this week, but that doesn't mean that the fighters won't deliver. So as long as the fights are good, that's really all I care about. And Jillian Robertson I love this girl I'm gonna keep my eye on her in the future obviously she is a finisher and the way she handled Frodo who's a black belt on the ground was insanely impressive she completely mauled the larger woman and we got a steal on her at minus 130 that was so good now unfortunately Pantoja dropped the ball that was a bit of a bummer but they put on a fight of the night contender actually you know what i apologize it wasn't a contender it was the fight of the night they actually called it fight of the night they got the 50k bonus and everything so it was a fun fight it was back and forth pantoja really he showed why he is where he is but figueredo dang dude that guy has got some serious power behind his hands and pantoja honestly i thought that his punches would have more of an effect on Figueredo. I know figueredo has got a good chin. I know he's big and strong for the division, but I really thought Pantoja would be able to hurt him. Pantoja's fast. Pantoja hits hard. He's got plenty of knockouts to his own name. So I really thought that it was going to be more back and forth on the striking. I thought Pantoja would have higher volume, but still be able to do damage. And then for Figueredo obviously can do damage and throw those big bombs. Um, what surprised me was how... Figueredo just walked through everything Pantoja tossed at him. I mean, it was like swatting flies out there. He had no regard for the power in Pantoja's hands, and that was honestly a little scary because uh, I know the kind of pan- the, the kind of power that Pantoja throws with. Wow, that was a tongue twister. So the fact that Figueredo was able to just kind of wade through that without an issue, whew, he is going to be a monster. Now, I do think it's fun that he's calling out Henry Cejudo and saying that he's scared because Cejudo mauls this guy. I'm sorry. He is, he stands no chance against Henry Cejudo. Cejudo will dump him on his back and pound his face into the mat. It won't be a good 
fight. But I'm hoping we get a good number on it because of the knockout power he brings to the table in that 16-1 and record. <laughs> so crossing my fingers that fight happens eventually. At any rate, I'm a fan of both guys. We were just on the wrong side of that one. Now here's where the night gets a little bit sketchy. We could have had an absolutely massive night at UFC 240. Massive night. It could have been incredible. Because our parlay comes through. Both Vivian Arahu and Armin Saryukian cash exactly the way that we thought that they would. They dominated their fights, respectively. Both of them clearly won two rounds at minimum in their fights. And that's exactly what we were looking for. We locked up that parlay at plus 111 for two units, which guaranteed us a profit on the night even if the worst should happen and unfortunately once again the worst did happen mark andre Barriolt at plus 147 did not get it done and like my boy shout out to at ufc bro picks give the man a follow over on twitter i think i'm done with burial i just he's not he's another one of those guys that has everything right there for him and he's just not improving and that's a problem if you've got all the tools and you've got all the physical gifts that you need, but you are not improving, you're not taking those steps in competition, and you're not showing those better performances. I mean, granted, Jocko is good. I don't want to take anything away from Christoph Jocko. He fought a very good fight, but the fact that he is so chinny, and Burial didn't even go for it, and it looked like Burial really slowed down in this fight. I don't know if he was tentative of the takedown, or what the actual issue was, but he didn't go for it the way I expected him to go for it. And we still almost got a split decision, which is where we want to be. So honestly, we did have value at that plus 147 line. It was a split decision loss. And if one more judge had just seen one more round our way, that's a win. So we were exactly where we wanted to be. Going forward, I'm going to be a lot more picky about when and if I ever choose Marc-Andre Barriolt again. Um, but for this particular time, I do not regret that bet. I think we were on the right side. I think we made a good play. And anybody that was back in Jocko, I know some people online said they felt like Jocko won 30-27. I don't agree with that. I don't know how you could ever possibly say Jocko got that 30-27. I think Barriolt clearly won one of the rounds, and then the other rounds were honestly sketchy. I mean, I had it one and one going into the third, and I think the third could have gone either way. It just depends on what you value as a judge. So uh, once again, long story short, don't regret that play whatsoever. I think we got all the value in the world out of that plus 147. So after that was our make or break fight, the one that the entire night swung in the balance of Nico Price. Now, I got him at plus 235, but the landslide of money that poured in left some of you all sitting with tickets in your pocket that had plus 280 written on them. And I am jealous of you that got that because, like I said, as always, I do the podcast on Tuesday nights and I take the lines that are available on Tuesday nights for better or for worse, which means a lot of times we beat these line moves, but every once in a while we get hosed by line moves because, well, I don't have any other option unless I tweet out the uh, the line later. So we had so much value here. I had I heard so many people, different podcasts, people on YouTube, people tweeting, Nico's got no shot. Nico's going to die. Nico is going to get killed. It's not even close. All in on Neil. I mean, those things were ridiculous. This fight should have been minus 150 plus 170, minus 145 plus 170, something in that ballpark. Um, the fact that he was a minus 300 favorite, the fact that they were saying he had a 25% chance or less of winning this fight was bonkers to me we had so much value in this line and if you watched the fights if you're one of those that bets and then just sees the results of course you're disappointed by that but if you're someone who actually watches the fights and sweats out your tickets price almost finished him twice not once but twice price was getting the better of neil he forces chaos and somebody like Neil, who's a technical striker, who wants to fight at a pace, who wants to set a pace, he got completely disrupted by Nico Price. And Nico hurt him. Every single time Neil would step in and hit Nico with something, Nico would counter with more volume than Price was putting on him. And he hurt him every single time he did it. And then there was the double knockdown. The stepbrothers hit each other in the head at the same time. Double knockdown. 
Price is the one that recovered. Nico got on top of Neil, and he was trying to finish. I really thought it was over. I thought he was going to ground and pound Neil into oblivion. And then when they came out for round two, one thing I'm really impressed with is Neil's uh, recoverability, because Price doesn't stop. I know just how much Price can recover. I absolutely am fully aware of how good Price is at tanking damage and coming back and delivering more to get it back on his opponent. But I didn't think Neil was going to come out as fresh as he did in round two. He came out level-headed, solid, tried to reestablish the game plan. I know they shifted gears a little bit, which is exactly what they needed to do to get the win, but I thought he was going to be a little more wobbly. I thought that he was going to be a little more loose and that Nico was going to put him away, but props to him. He showed just how high level he is to be able to switch gears like that and then get it done. Um, The stoppage, you could argue it was slightly late. I mean, Sorry, not late, early. You could argue it was just a little bit early. Not a lot. I'm not saying this is a robbery. I'm not saying the ref should have let that continue because Price was taking damage and he wasn't defending intelligently the way that you need to, but he obviously wasn't out either. So, you know, maybe you could have let the scramble go on a little bit better. I'm not mad about the stoppage. I'm just, I'm honestly flabbergasted that Neil survived what Nico Price put him through to then come back and do what he did. So anybody who laid that kind of wood with Neil was sweating bullets the entire fight, whereas those of us with price tickets in our pockets were jumping up and down, screaming our faces off because we thought we were about to cash in on a big, big winner. And that's what we're looking for. That is my definition of value. When you're the one excited rather than scared, That means you're on the right side of the bet, in my opinion, especially when you've got a line like plus 230 or somewhere between that and plus 280. So all in all, really, really good night. Really good night for us. So for the podcast picks, we end up going four and three for plus 104 units. And I will take it. I don't mind it one bit. It could have been, like I said, it could have been a huge night if either Marc-Andre Burial or Nico Price get the nod. This is where variance comes into play. I'm going to give my variance speech to y'all one more time. Variance is a double-edged sword. I relate all this stuff back to poker. That's where I got my start in gambling. When you have ace-king and your opponent has pocket queens and you get it all in before the flop, that is a 50-50. If you crunch the numbers for thousands, hundreds of thousands of times, it's going to come out 50-50. That's how it works. You can go on a bad run of losing 15, 20, 30 of those in a row, but that tide will shift over the course of a lifetime, over the course of bet after bet after bet. And that's where variance, we will get the better of it, I promise you. Because when we're getting plus 147 on our 50-50, when we're getting plus 135 or plus 280, I'm sorry, 235 plus 280, On our coin flip, when it's 50-50 and we are making more money than our opponents are, when we hit, that's where the value comes into play. And that right there is why the 2019 podcast record is 87 and 79 for plus 28.97 units. It sounds like I don't have a very good record when it comes to the picks, but that massive amount of units that we have is because we take those massive dog lines when we when we find value. So it will even out. Don't worry. We still posted a winner. There are going to be more opportunities and we'll get it done. I promise you that. So I know we didn't have any official bets on either the co-main or the main event, but those were some fun fights to watch. All props to Felicia Spencer. I almost took the stab at her and there was value obviously on her at plus 500, the way she cut Cyborg early, the way she was able to physically get in there and control someone big and strong like Cyborg. I mean, realistically, this was the second UFC fight for this lady and she showed us that she can stand in there with the second best potentially women's fighter of all time. I mean, whoa, (laughs) talk about a sophomore appearance. She really shined in there. I think she's got a really great future in MMA and in the UFC. She turned a whole lot of heads. I was cheering for her. I really wanted her to get it done. Um, And those of you that got Chris Cyborg, congratulations. You know, that was uh, another one of those ones where In hindsight, it was a relatively dominant decision for Chris Cyborg, but Felicia made you sweat a whole lot. She made you sweat throughout that fight. (laughs) And those odds were wider than I felt comfortable with. Now, in the main event, I 
absolutely was, well, I don't say absolutely wrong. Um, Max Holloway got it done, dominantly got it done. And that's where everyone talking about, oh, Frankie Edgar's got value. This line is too wide. I didn't agree. I never agreed. Max Holloway beats Frankie Edgar nine out of 10 times. And I only say nine out of 10 times because there's that banana peel. Every once in a while, Frankie will do something crazy. Every once in a while, Max Holloway's tendon will rupture and Frankie will get it done. But really, they're just, Frankie Edgar is the worst. I'm sorry. Frankie Edgar is the best opponent for Max Holloway. Max has everything he needs. He has the exact physical tools, the talent, the skills. He's got everything to destroy a Frankie Edgar just every time. It's like Jose Aldo. They are so, so similar in this spot, just physically speaking and ability-wise. That's what I said when I did the breakdown. Holloway all day. You get plus 500 on Frankie Edgar ten <laughs> so many times. You're going to have value on plus 500 with Frankie Edgar, not against Max Holloway. Max Holloway steamrolls Frankie, and I'm sorry to say that because I'm such a big fan of Frankie. It was heartbreaking to see him after the fight sobbing and being upset because he lost another opportunity at a title, and unfortunately, that's the the painful game that we are in. MMA is rough. MMA is hard. The legends that we grow up loving, the fighters that we watch go from college wrestlers to world champions they sputter out they fade out and die because they can't keep up with the next generation unfortunately and it's the cycle that we have to watch because we love the sport and it was tough to watch frankie go through that it really was i don't know where he goes from here um i know a lot of people are talking about him dropping a weight class i wouldn't mind because i mean he obviously does still have gas in the tank but it's not going to get better from here folks he can be a top 10 guy for a little while and then he'll be a top 10 uh, top 15 guy And then he's going to get his skull caved in by a young, hungry up-and-comer. And And he will go the route of BJ Penn eventually. So I kind of hope he gets out before it's too late. I wouldn't mind him taking one or two more fights, even if he stays at 145 and doesn't drop down to 135. Just school a couple people that are right there in that mid-level so he still goes out on a win. We still know just how good and how dominant he is. Um, And then retire. Then hang it up. Call it a day. He's had a amazing career and unfortunately i was wrong about max holloway getting it done in round four what i didn't take into account fully or well enough is the takedown threat of frankie edgar i knew max holloway was going to be able to defend it and everyone was saying how frankie was going to be the guy that could get max down max has never faced a wrestler of frankie's caliber i even said that myself but max did exactly what i said and he had no problem with it even though frankie's incredible max just has all the physical gifts to be able to handle it he only gave up one takedown i think it was 14 out of 15 that he defended or 13 out of 14 something like that and he kept his phenomenal takedown defense rate intact at ufc 240 but what it did was it slowed down his offense the couple times in round three round four At the end of round three and at the end of round four, he really did start to unload and go after it. He started hunting like he does, and I love when he does this. He smells blood, he goes for it, and he finishes. And I think it was the threat. Because Frankie's so good at the takedown, he couldn't just shrug it off. So he couldn't go into his full hunter-killer mode the way he does, because he still had to be at least kind of respectful and kind of mindful of the takedown in order to be able to defend them, which means he didn't let his hands go the way he needed to. So he rocked Frankie several times, and I really thought he'd be able to pour it on and get his chin out of there, but the one time he tried to do that, Frankie did get in on a takedown, and Max almost went down. So I think he was content to just ride out the decision, knowing that he was going to be able to piece Frankie up. If the finish came and materialized, then great. If not, he knew he was going to get the win. And I can't fault him there. That was something that, like I said, I overlooked how much that takedown was going to affect the way that Max was going to be able to fight. So that'll do it. That's the recap for UFC 240. Let's move this ship along. First things first, I do have to remind everybody, we have a partnership with betodds.ag. Roll on over to Bet Odds. They're offering diehard MMA podcast listeners a 100% bonus deposit match, $50 to $500. They will match that 100%. And football season's coming up. I know we like to bet on MMA, and there's uh, MMA events basically every single weekend for us to get our degenerate cash down on, but 
football season's right around the corner, so do not forget that. If uh, you're looking for some extra coins, some extra bonus rollover, so you can have a little extra walking around money while you're uh, doing your degenerate football gambling this season, this is a perfect opportunity. BetOdds.ag, they're offering deposit bonuses to pretty much everybody else around 50-60%, but for diehard podcast members, it's that full 100% bonus. Use code fe 6 E F B Frank Edward six Edward Frank Bravo. That's the code for diehard MMA podcast listeners. Go get yourself some easy cash. And it's even easier when I'm handing out winners on the podcast. They don't like me very much because y'all keep cashing. (laughs) All right. And this week I've got to give a shout out to my lady, Sarah Jackson. Once again, she's doing her thing over there. We've got new subscribers over on YouTube. We've got Orano 2003. Jason Critchlow, that's a new one, Mr. Bobby Fresh, Daniel Wright, oh boy, Mr. Green, we've got lots of misters this week, I'm, I like it, I like it, Jesse Moreno, we are growing, the Die Hard MMA podcast fan base is growing, thank you so much for all the support, Die Hards, I love it, we're up to 243 subscribers, and I'm stoked, last week we actually broke some numbers um for podcast downloads day one podcast downloads we broke a hundred and that was a new benchmark for me um youtube has been the place where we get the majority of the views and listens we broke 700 on ufc san antonio which was phenomenal and we're knocking on the door of 500 basically every single other week so everything is steaming the right direction thank you all so much for the love and support i will continue to do shout outs i would love to answer some fan questions if you have any Hit me up on any of the places where you can reach me. Twitter, at DieHardMMAPod, on the YouTube channel. Feel free to comment on any of the videos. I'll get a notification. Um, hit me up on Instagram, Facebook, whatever you want to do. I would love to get some more interaction going. Let's get into UFC Newark. Uh, let's go. We are kicking the night off with the ladies, which works for me because we have been riding an excellent win streak of late as far as our reads and our bets go on women's MMA. So I love that there are multiple ladies fights this evening. Let's get into it. We have women's flyweight Miranda Granger facing Hannah Goldie. Now this is a really, really weird situation where it's a double debutante fight. Both of these women are starting their UFC careers on Saturday. Neither one of them has a UFC fight. Hannah Goldie is the closest thing that we have to a UFC fight coming off of Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series. And by the way, Hannah is the Queen of Sparta. I love that nickname, and I really am looking forward to some good stuff with this lady. So, getting straight into the breakdown, there's not a whole lot for us to go off, because like I said, they're both making their UFC debuts. It's the usual thing where they have all fought a low level of competition for the most part, so we kind of have to take a little bit of liberty as far as what we're reading into. Hannah Goldie has some really uh, crisp, crisp hands. She's got fast punches, she's got great takedown defense, and she is strong. In fact, I would go so far as to label her as thick. This girl is hot. I'm sorry. I love it. She's one of those, like, monster muscle type lady she looks like she's a fitness model she is short she's stocky and she is absolutely shredded now she made her pro debut in 2016 and she took a while off in 2017 she actually had a child and then she came back and she's won four straight fights since she's got good kicks she finishes combos with head kicks and leg kicks which i love in her dana white to dana white's contender series fight she outlanded her opponent 141 to 56 in significant strikes. She has excellent output at this weight class. She really seems like she's built for it. Now, Miranda on the other side of this, which um, it's really a contrast of styles here. She's really tall, she's really rangy, and honestly, she's really skinny. She looks like she could be a weight class down. In fact, I believe for the most part she does fight a weight class down so it's going to be interesting to see how that affects the fight here because hannah goldie she looks like she belongs at this weight class whereas i don't know if miranda does so the extra weight i think leans favorable to hannah um now miranda is a finisher 
She's the one who's got a longer MMA career, and she has finished every single one of her opponents. She actually has a long or a decently long amateur career to go on top of that. So really, she's not like 6-0, and she's like 11-0. and She's got excellent attacks with uh, leg kicks, knees, good work from the clinch, good kicks from distance, and she actually has really good BJJ. When she gets on the back, she really controls her opponent, she goes for submissions, she scrambles well to get up to her feet. This is a tough fight to call. This is a really, really tough fight to call because both of these women honestly are deserving of their UFC debuts. I kind of wish they weren't debuting against one another because, I mean, Hannah came off the Tuesday Night Contender Series. She's undefeated. She's pretty. She's got the fit thing going on, which that's all the rage these days. I mean, she could just quit and be an Instagram model if she wanted to be and she would do just fine. Miranda is tall. She is also attractive. They're both very skilled. Miranda is the finisher of the two, whereas Hannah is the grinder. So it's really tough. It's really, really tough. Um, Like I said, if they were fighting anybody else, I would bet on both of them. Um, Hannah Goldie's sitting right around minus 165 at this point, with Miranda Granger being plus 135. I think that line is about accurate. I don't know that I want to make a play on this one simply because... Miranda's a finisher, she's going to have the height and reach advantage, and I think there might be some value on her as the dog, because I think this is a 50-50 fight, but my gut tells me that Hannah Goldie wins. I don't like taking the stab on dog plays, even if I think that there's value on the other side, when I'm convinced that the favorite is going to win, because I want to bet on a dog that I legitimately think is going to win the fight, because at the end of the day, we're stacking units, right? I know, statistically speaking, odds-wise, all the smart people out there, you're going to tell me, well, if there's value, you bet the value because we're playing a numbers game. I know that. But it also sucks to lose a bet. And especially like last week, now, I'm not saying that this is the reason I'm doing this. This is not the reason I'm passing. But like last week, we had two perfectly good underdogs. We had massive value on both underdogs. Neither of them came through. We lost two units. There's enough questions surrounding this fight that I may be completely wrong when I say that Hannah Goldie should be the favorite. I might be completely wrong. And I could also be wrong on the flip side of that, where maybe Hannah Goldie's a minus 300 favorite, and she's only minus 165 because she's going to just maul Granger by getting the takedown, pinning her up against the cage, pounding her, having the faster hands being on the inside track. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that could happen in this fight. Long story short, I think Goldie wins... If you want action on this fight, I would personally bet Goldie, but I'm passing. For the second fight of the night, in stark contrast to the women's division at uh, 115 or 125 pounds, we are moving all the way up to the men's welterweight division. (laughs) And we've got Claudio Henrique da Silva, 36 years old, 13 and 1, fighting out of Brazil. He's got a late short notice replacement. He went from being a plus 200 underdog that I was eyeballing very, very closely to being a minus 400 favorite against the debuting Cole Williams. Cole Williams is 35. He has 11 wins and one loss. He's making his UFC debut at the ripe old age of 35. Good for him for getting here. It took him a while, but he made it. Now, Claudio Silva... He's an absolute BJJ specialist. This guy is phenomenal on the mat. He's got surprising forward pressure. It's kind of the Damian Maya style where he can throw with reckless abandon because he wants it on the ground. So if you get a little flustered and you go for a takedown because he's just kind of winging whatever he wants at you, that's fine with him. He doesn't mind starting on the ground from a bad position and then getting where he wants to be from there. He closes the distance very well. He's got good leg kicks, and he's actually a pretty decent chain wrestler to get in where he wants to be. Once it hits the mat, if he's on bottom, he's got excellent sweeps and back takes to get where he can finish, where he can be offensive and aggressive. He actually has underrated and improved striking, which is something that uh, I took notice of when I was re-watching his tapes. You think of him as a BJJ guy, and then you go back and watch, and it's kind of like when Khabib landed that big power shot on Connor, and everybody lost their minds. It's because Connor was worried about the takedown. Connor was not expecting Khabib to throw a haymaker, and it got him right on the jaw. That's kind of what Silva does here. You're so worried about the takedown. You're so worried about keeping this thing standing that you kind of forget he can throw head kicks if he wants to. (laughs) He's got good ground and pound once he gets it down there. Um, He does tend to gas out a little bit, though, and that's something that 
I'm not the biggest fan of. If you're going to gas out and slow down, you can give away fights, you can give away rounds. It's not great. He actually was in a bad spot a little bit in his last fight against Danny Hot Chocolate Roberts because he was running out of gas in round three. Now, Roberts, though, he came in the fight. He came in the shape of his career, his last fight. He was ready to go, and I thought he was going to get the win there for a second. I'm pretty sure we bet on Silva that fight, so maybe dodged a bullet. I'll take it. (laughs) So Cole Williams. This guy's interesting. He's a college-level wrestler, and he was on Fightmaster, the Bellator Fightmaster, which I guess was kind of their attempt to answer the Ultimate Fighter, and he trained under Randy Couture while he was on Fightmaster. He lost in the semifinals to Joe Diesel Riggs. Now, Joe Riggs, UFC veteran. He's a legend over here in Arizona. He's kind of the hometown you know, cage fighter guy that everyone knows and loves. Uh, It's unfortunate to see what happened to Joe Riggs because he made it all the way up to the UFC. And by then he was just kind of too, uh, too many miles on him at that point to really have a good run at it. So I was bummed when it didn't go well for him once he made it to the UFC. But this guy losing to a guy like Joe Riggs when he was in that state, that tells you something. I mean, Joe couldn't hang in the UFC at this point, but he was able to handle Cole Williams at this point. So Something to keep in mind. Now, he's fought a relatively low level of regional competition. He's got a good finish rate. He's knocked out four people. He's submitted four people. And then he's only gone to decision three times. But his lone loss did come by submission. And that's another thing that we want to note here. He's a decent wrestler. He's not a great wrestler. He's old. He's getting close to that, you know, ripe 40-year-old Silva's still in pretty dang good shape. So even though Silva's a year older, I mean, really, if you look at this as kind of an old man type of fight, um, Silva's got way more left in the tank, in my opinion. He is a justified minus 400 over Cole Williams. And I, I don't see how Cole gets out of this fight. This is one where I'm not a big fan of these wide lines, but I don't understand how Cole gets out of this fight. He should absolutely get mauled. Silva should choke him unconscious. And that's so evident by the line. You can get Silva inside the distance at minus 160 right now. And I think that's appropriate because Silva subs basically everybody. He's got eight submission wins, 62%. Cole gasses out himself when this fight goes on. And like I said, he leans on his wrestling. He's going to try to bang. He's going to try to strike. He doesn't have the best takedown defense. This is going to hit the mat. And once it does, he is nowhere near the level of Claudio Henrique da Silva. And because of that, we're on that prop. We are going to take Silva inside the distance at minus 160. That's right. We're going to lay the juice on a prop, which is not something we normally do. But this dude is a can. He's coming in on less than a week's notice to face a massively, massively talented Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt UFC caliber fighter, which is something he's never done on either side of that equation. Minus 160 on Silva inside the distance. All right, we are headed back down to 125 pounds for the women's flyweight division, where Lauren Murphy takes on Mara Romero Borella. Lauren Murphy is 36 years old, 10 and 4. Morella, on the flip side of that, is 12 and 5. She is only 33. Lauren Murphy has been rather hot and cold in her UFC career. She made her UFC debut in 2014, dropped fights back-to-back to to Sarah McMahon, Liz Carmouche, and then she went uh, 50-50. She does the whole win-loss, win-loss, win-loss thing. Her last fight came against Sajara Eubanks, where she got dominated over three rounds. Just, you know, we we know all about Sajara after the last couple breakdowns involving her with Roxanne Modafferi and stuff like that. Big, physical type of lady, so no surprise that someone like Lauren Murphy struggled with that um barilla on the other side of things she's a little bit younger she fights out of italy and she's been very very impressive now she only has three ufc fights one of those was a decision loss to chukagian which let's be real everybody loses by decision to caitlin chukagian has the guys over at half the battle say you got chuked because <laughs> she just knows how to weasel herself a victory even if uh We don't necessarily feel like she should get it. She manages to take it, which honestly is a sign of a good fighter, and I should stop trying to bet against her. Lauren Murphy has 30% takedown accuracy. She's got 62% takedown defense, and she uses the cage really, really, really well to get back up. So if she does hit the ground, she's got it. First and foremost, she's got a good solid takedown defense percent. But when she gets down, 
she does a pretty good job of getting back up. Now, she has a bit of pillow fists. She doesn't really hurt anybody. She doesn't hit too hard. She's got kind of sloppy striking. She does move forward. She does have good forward pressure, but she's slow and she's plodding. And like I said, when she hits you, it just doesn't really do a whole lot. She's not rocking anybody. She's not TKOing anybody. It's just not a thing. Now, she does average 3.81 significant strikes absorbed per minute versus her 3.73 landed per minute. So she's actually absorbing more significant strikes, although barely, she's absorbing more significant strikes than she is outputting on her opponent's basically every single fight. She's only got 40% striking accuracy, and then she's got a 60% striking defense, which by itself isn't bad, but the numbers don't lie. She's getting hit more often, harder, than her opponents do. Now, Morella on the flip side of this, first and foremost, you've got to know, I love this lady because she walks out to Lindsay freaking Sterling. If you don't know who Lindsay Sterling is, go YouTube her. She's a violinist who does like electronic dance type of mixes in with the violin and then she does nerd type album covers so like video game theme songs halo pokemon good stuff i'm a nerd i love it <laughs> so go check Lindsay sterling out she's amazing and i love that borella walks out to Lindsay sterling's music before she got into mma she was actually a personal trainer and a judo instructor now she was a judo black belt but it's one of those things that she just kind of naturally flowed into MMA with that kind of a background. She has amazing forward pressure. So this is going to be interesting because when two people have forward pressure, one of them's got to give, right? So you don't know, I mean, maybe one of them comes in with a game plan that they're okay giving up that forward pressure in a spot, or they're just going to collide. In this kind of a case, I don't see either one wanting to move backwards. I think they're going to collide, and I think Borella wins that pressure offense game when they start playing chicken she has really good submission defense so if this thing does hit the ground she's not going to be in any danger of getting submitted she's very very smart about making sure she is in a safe place she has aggressive offensive cage work which i really like she can pin her opponents up against the fence wear on them beat on them and she's very very physically strong in her last fight against santos um talia santos she just stood right up with Santos on her back. I mean, full back mount. You think she's being held down. You think she's got the crushing body weight on her and she's not going anywhere and she's going to get choked out. She just stood up. She was like, no, I got this. I'm fine. And stood right up with a whole nother human being on her back. Very impressive, especially once again for the women's division. Very impressive to have that kind of physicality, that kind of physical strength. She, like I mentioned, is a judo black belt, so she knows her way around the ground. Believe it or not, when you train judo, you do train some things like arm bars, things like that. They get mixed in. So she knows her way around the ground, and she has a absolutely suffocating top game. When she gets on top of somebody, I don't know if she's going to be able to get Murphy on the mat, but if she does, the people have a hard time getting up. The ladies that she gets on top of don't go anywhere and she does a real good job of draining you once she gets on there now she trains at att which as we know is one of the best and hottest gyms in mma right now actually most likely the best and hottest gym in mma right now she's got a 44 percent takedown accuracy with a 50 percent takedown defense so her takedown accuracy is going to be better than murphy's and honestly with murphy's takedown accuracy being as low as it is 50 percent takedown defense i i think she's got the skills to keep it standing i really do i think that will be enough now when it comes to her striking she's got 70 percent striking defense she outputs 3.37 significant strikes per minute and she's got a 70 percent striking defense that's an astounding difference in numbers especially when you flip that and like we talked about now i know i'm very stat heavy in this fight i go stat heavy when stat heavy is required this is a fight where stat heavy is required. Mor Mara Romero Barillo puts out damage and doesn't take any back. Murphy gets hit more often and harder than she hits her opponents. This is going to be a stand-up fight, and it's going to be Barella all freaking day. Murphy's not going to be able to take Barella down. Barella might be able to get Lauren down. If it does get to the ground, however, she's going to have no problem either dominating the ground game or getting back to her feet. This is another home freaking run where I feel like we are getting served a cupcake. So we are going to be all over Mara Barilla. 
She's going to be our next pick for the night. And right now, we can lock Barilla up at minus 165. And that's a gift. This this fight opened up with <laughs> Barilla being a minus 165 favorite and Murphy being a plus 145 favorite. 66% of the money has come in on Lauren Murphy, and that line hasn't budged so the majority it's it's not quite a reverse line movement situation it's close it's almost the same thing not quite the fact that the line hasn't moved means there's just enough money that the bookmakers value on the favorite that they're not willing to let it budge even though most of the money is coming in on the dog so it's sitting right where it opened and i'll take it i don't see a path to victory for lauren murphy i think that barilla wins this thing handily whether she finishes or has a runaway unanimous decision, I think it's Barilla all night. We will lay the juice. Minus 165 with Mara Barilla. Something I want to give everybody a little bit of a heads up on here is uh, this is going to be a favorite heavy card. I know our whole strategy here at the Die Hard MMA podcast is that we like to bet on underdogs because there's value on the underdogs in MMA. But I don't see a lot of live dogs this week. Other people might, and I I will let you know, of course, as we go through the podcast, my individual reads, but honestly, I don't get what some people are seeing in these fights. I think this is very heavily slated to the dogs, and we've had, I'm sorry, to the favorites, and we've had a good run of dogs lately where big dogs have been coming through and cashing. Eventually, that is going to swing to the other side. Eventually, that pendulum is going to go where it's supposed to be, and these favorites who are statistically and physically the better fighters they're going to start coming through again because they're supposed to, and they will. <laughs> so just a heads up, this card is not that sexy, and it's definitely not that sexy and exciting from a betting perspective, but I think I've identified some spots where we can still make some cash. So moving right along, we are going to go to our next fight, men's flyweight division for once. <laughs> Jordan Espinoza takes on Matt Schnell. Jordan Espinoza is 14-5-0. and oh. Matt Schnell is 13-4. and four. Getting right down into this matchup, this one is another young up-and-comer type of fight type of situation, and I love these because we really get to see what these guys are made of. Jordan Espinoza is absolutely the more athletic of the two fighters. This is going to be kind of a skill, technique versus athleticism type of matchup. He's very, very light on his feet. He's got really good, like, quick in-and-out movement, so it's kind of hard to kind of hard to hit him just because he moves in so quick and then he gets out of the way really quick. His level change is like lightning. When he decides he wants to go for a takedown, he is so fast getting in on those hips. It's really impressive. Now, one thing he does do though, is he moves backwards with his chin straight up. It's almost like tall man defense. He's got the speed defense. He thinks he's fast enough to get out of the way. So if he needs to, he'll lift his chin up in the air, just trying to get that extra little bit to get away from the bomb. He's kind of hittable. Now, if you can match his speed, he is hittable. He comes in with his hands down. He leaves his chin open when he backs out. He really relies on that athleticism and that speed, almost kind of like Anderson Silva used to. I think that's kind of what he's trying to model his fighting style after. But if you are just as fast as him or you're a little faster, you're going to be able to clip him. He got really, really hurt. In his Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series fight, Riley Dutro, he got blasted by that dude. And he got, I mean, (laughs) that's one of those things where in a Contender Series fight, you don't know quite how good the opposition is. Dutro could have ended it. I mean, maybe we're talking about Dutro if he has just another quick second. Because Dutro was on a decent bit of a roll until he ran into Espinosa. That was a good fight, and he showed that he could hurt Espinosa, and that's something that I think is going to play out in the UFC. Obviously, if someone at that level can clip him and hurt him unless he patches up some of those holes, these UFC caliber guys are going to be able to do that as well. Now, the fight got stopped against Dutro with only about two seconds left, and this is something that I find very interesting. I don't think it should have been stopped. Espinosa hit Dutro with a big bomb, and they had been trading all night. That was a war. That was an absolutely fun fight to watch. So Dutro gets clipped. Yes, he gets hurt, and he kind of rolls away. He turns his back, and that doesn't mean the fight's over. He wasn't out. He wasn't not defending himself. He was trying to make space and get to a place where he was safer, and the ref stepped in and waved it off immediately, immediately waved it off. And I'm just, I'm flabbergasted. I I don't understand 
why the referee would stop the fight at that point because Espinosa was not already on top of him pounding him out he was not in immediate danger yes he turned his back from him but he was already continuing to roll to get where he was facing the right direction to defend himself and the ref thought he should stop it it's not like he had a broken jaw and he was crumpled up in a you know fetal position covering his head or something like that really really weird so I don't give him credit for that TKO stoppage. I know he's fast. I know he's athletic. I know he hits hard. He did not TKO Riley Dutro. Let's make sure we are all clear on that. Matt Schnell on the flip side of this thing. Oh, first off, I want to mention Espinosa is 29. Matt Schnell is also 29. That's why that mattered. I'm going to come over here and Matt Schnell is uh, another one of these fighters fighting out of American Top Team, which we are very, very fond of. I kind of wish someone would go back and do the numbers. Maybe I should do that at some point. I want to go back and see all the UFC fighters out of uh, ATT and just plug the numbers in, see how much money you would make if you just blindly bet UFC level ATT fighters and see how they do because these these guys and girls are phenomenal. He's got really fast hands. He's got crisp boxing. He's got good footwork and movement, and he's extremely fast. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> he's got good clinch knees. He really works well out of the clinch, actually. I was impressed with that. He has body locks, body lock takedowns that are really solid. And once he gets on top, he's got really, really good top control, which training out of ATT, you would expect when they get on the ground, they know what they're doing out of that gym. He is aggressive with his transitions. He's aggressive with his attacks. He's got an offensive submission game, which I always like. And he's a finisher. He's got seven submissions for a 54% uh, submission rate. He's got two KO TKOs, and then he's only gotten a decision three times out of his 13 wins. So dude's a finisher. And he actually has been in the UFC for a decent amount of time. This will be his sixth UFC fight, and he is riding a nice little three fight win streak. He has never looked better. He's getting better every single fight. And that's something that I really look for with these younger fighters, because they can struggle against top level competition. No problem. They're young. They're putting it together. They're still, you know, coming into their own. These guys are both about to hit their prime. Matt Schnell has UFC caliber opposition for his last five fights. Espinosa has one UFC fight against Eric Shelton, and he won that thing by decision. Yes, it was unanimous, but Shelton isn't really that... Eh, I don't want to say he's bad. I mean, but he's not great either. <laughs> so when it comes to the level of competition, Matt Schnell has that. Espinosa is fast, he's strong, he's powerful, he's athletic, but what I said was somebody with speed is going to be able to clip him because he does leave his chin open. Machnell's got really fast hands. He's also got really heavy hands. I think he's going to be able to hurt Jordan Espinosa. If Espinosa can implement a grappling heavy game, put Schnell on his back, and just kind of leave him there, rough him up, ride him out, keep him on the mat, then yeah, he can win this thing. The biggest thing here, though, is I don't know that he can. First off, like I said, Schnell is good and active off of his back, so the submission threat will be there. He also will be able to get up to his feet. I believe he'll be able to stand back up. He knows how to do that. And then I think the speed advantage is going to be something that really, really plays here. Jordan Espinosa also tends to slow down. He uses all that athletic energy up in the first couple of rounds, and if he doesn't put his opponent away, he starts to gas out. That's something I saw in the Eric Shelton fight. He really started to dip off and slow down. And that's where I think someone with more experience like Matt Schnell is going to be able to turn it up if that happens. If he's behind on the scorecards, he will go for a finish. If he needs to, he will hunt that TKO victory. And that's the kind of thing that you're looking for when you're placing a bet like this. Now, I do apologize. I should have tweeted this one out because I got Matt Schnell myself at even money. I just kind of jumped on it. I didn't really think about the line movement. I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. Um, I thought actually the pendulum might swing the other direction and we might get some dog money back on him. Um... But unfortunately, I'm not the only one seeing these things. The line opened up with Matt Schnell being a plus 130 favorite. I'm sorry, Matt Schnell is a plus 130 underdog. Jordan Espinosa, minus 150 favorite. 67% of the money has come in on Matt Schnell. I agree with that. He is, actually right now, the market's kind of undecided. There's a couple places where uh, Espinosa is still a slight favorite. You know, minus 115, minus 125. There's a couple of places where that line is flipped and Schnell is the favorite at minus 115, um, minus 110, minus 110s in places. And right now we can get a minus 105. So not that bad. 
I only cost you all five cents. I do apologize for the five cents, though. Let's lock up Matt Schnell at minus 105. I think he's got all the tools to get it done. And until Jordan Espinoza shows me that he is UFC caliber, um, well, I'm not going to say I don't believe it. He is UFC caliber. He does belong here. He does have a bright future. But I do think this might be a little bit of a stacked deck against him for only his second UFC fight. Combine that with the fact that Matt Schnell is only getting better and really appears to be peaking. I think this is a really good fight for him to take another step and show that he's kind of maybe the next big thing in the division. Let's go with Matt Schnell, minus 105. Our next fight takes us back to the women's 135 pound division and the return of the Modafiri Whisperer. That's right. The Modafiri expert is on the line for y'all to break this. Wait a sec. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Clint, Roxanne Modafiri is not fighting this weekend. I know. But her last fight is very much influencing this one, and I am so excited to break this one down for all of you. Antonina Shevchenko, the older Shevchenko, the lesser Shevchenko, is fighting Lucy the Bullet Pudilova. First things first, let's get this out of the way. You're fighting a a girl whose nickname is your older sister's nickname. No, 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 Lucy, you are not the bullet. Valentina is the bullet. Valentina Shevchenko is the only bullet, and this lady's going to try and stomp that nickname out of you because that belongs to her sister. (laughs) So what's happening here is everybody okay so you remember we bet i'm sorry i'm i'm all mixed up here because i'm so excited for this one you remember we bet roxanne modifieri at plus 300 i know i know i know i've humble bragged about it way too much we cashed in easy on shevchenko's last fight against roxanne modifieri where she dropped a decision to roxanne modifieri because she was able to address the takedown well everybody took that and went whoa She's so good. Roxanne Modafiri is so, so good. And in her next fight, there was a landslide of money against uh, for Roxanne Modafiri against Jennifer Maya, and they were wrong. We knew exactly where Roxanne Modafiri was at, and we were able to cash a two-unit play on her because of that. Well, what's also happening here is they are going, eh, Shevchenko's just not that good. Roxanne beat her, so she can't be that good. As much as they are lifting Roxanne up a little too high, they are being a little too mean to Antonina Shevchenko. This is the younger sister, I'm sorry, the older sister, but this is the sibling of the champion Valentina the Bullet Shevchenko. The UFC finally got their paws on her, and she steps in as a minus crazy 450 favorite, 500 favorite against Roxanne Modafiri, and she shits the bed. The UFC don't like that. They spend a lot of time and resources getting their hands on this lady. They want to see some return for that. You really think they're matching her up in a bad spot for her second fight? No. They're going to give her a bounce back. This line opened up with Shevchenko being a minus 200 favorite, and so much money has poured in on Lucy Pudilova that they've driven her from a plus 160 dog down to plus 125. The line is so low, we can get Antonina Shevchenko at minus 141. And I know I'm kind of tipping my hand here on the pick before I do the breakdown, but I'm floored. I can't believe just how short-sighted everybody is being in this case. Let me break this down for you. Let's start with Shevchenko. Her weakness is the takedown, right? We know that. That's how Modafiri got it done. But Modafiri didn't have the easiest time getting it done, and she's actually got a decent takedown game. She's a veteran of the sport. She knows her way around the grappling, and that was the biggest hole in Shevchenko's game. As much as Roxanne is a veteran and a pro on the ground, Shevchenko is a veteran and a pro on the feet. You take her out of her comfort zone, and she's a fish out of water. Now, on the feet, though, she is something to behold. She averages... 5.29 significant strikes per minute with 56% accuracy. That's awesome. Now, with her dealing out 5.29 significant strikes a minute, she only absorbs 2.09. That's a phenomenal 65% defense rate. She is basically outlanding her opponent with significant strikes 19%. It's a ridiculous amount of output differential. She hits you 
and she doesn't get hit. And it's on next level. Now, she's a Muay Thai world champion. She is a kickboxing world champion. She has a kickboxing Muay Thai record prior to getting into MMA. Or I mean, I know she did both at the same time. So her kickboxing and Muay Thai career, she's got, she's 39 and one. She's got one professional loss on the feet. When you mix in the ground game, she's seven and one. And that one was only that last fight against Roxanne Modafferi, who's a ground specialist. People are talking up Lucy Pudilova like she's the next coming of Amanda Nunez. I don't get it. She's 25 years old. She's good. Don't get me wrong. She's good. But she dropped her last two fights to Irene Aldana and Liz Carmouche. Now, I know Liz Carmouche. We got to kind of put a scratch through that one. That's grappling heavy fight. And that's not something that we're going to see here. But she lost to Lena Landsberg and she lost to Irene Aldana on the feet. I know the Aldana fight was a split, so it was close. But the fact that it was close still says something. Lucy Pudilova has never attempted a takedown in her UFC career. Not one. And that right there proves to me, and it should prove to you, that the UFC is giving Shevchenko a leg up here. They go, so we just lost, and she's not that great on the mat, and she can't really defend the takedown. What do we do with this girl? You give her somebody who's not going to go for the takedown. You give her somebody who's going to fight her on her own terms. Pudilova's never once gone for a takedown in her entire UFC career. Do you think she's suddenly be- going to become a wrestler for this fight and this fight only? Now, if she does suddenly go into her wrestling training, is she going to get good enough to be able to overcome the physicality of Shevchenko and actually get her to the mat? Okay, let's let's suspend our disbelief here for a second and pretend she does. Can she hold her there? You think she's going to get good enough at that that she'll then be able to hold Shevchenko down? For 15 minutes, or at least enough to make a difference to win, I I just don't see it happening. Shevchenko is strong, she's athletic, and she trained takedown defense and get-ups for Roxanne Modafferi all day. I don't think Lucy coming in here on a short camp is going to be able to improve enough in that area to suddenly have it make a difference. On top of that, she's only averaging 4.87 significant strikes per minute with a 38% accuracy, And then she's only got a 53% significant striking defense with a 4.21 significant strikes absorbed per minute. Now, those are normally speaking relatively decent stats. But against someone who's an elite level striker, that shows the difference between these two fighters. And I think it's going to be obvious when they get there in the cage. The other thing is she does struggle when she gets her back put on the mat. So if this thing does ever scramble, if it does ever hit the floor... She can't really get off of her back. And I think Shevchenko is going to have the strength and athleticism advantage here that if she ends up on top, Pudilova's probably not getting up or she's going to take a lot of damage doing so. She keeps her hands low. I will give you that she moves and she circles well and she's tough. The girl's tough. She can take a shot. But keeping your hands low and giving up that kind of a significant strike absorbed per minute rating, only a 53% defense, um, and then only outputting 38% accuracy, I think Shevchenko is going to eat her for breakfast. I don't get the love for Lucy Putilova here. I really think people are blind in this case. I think this is a home run. We're going to lay two units on Antonina Shevchenko. I am also competing in uh, my guy uh, MMA Lock of the Night. He's ro- he's hosting a podcast. I'm sorry. <laughs> Of course, he's hosting a podcast. He's hosting a contest. I retweeted it a little while ago, and I mentioned that um, I'm going to be involved in this buy-in. Basically, it's a a lock of the night buy-in. You make your pick, one lock of the night, one quote-unquote five-unit bet, and at the end of this run, I think we're going till Christmas, whoever wins, we're going to total it up. It's almost like a a fantasy football kind of thing. We're going to total up the amount of money, first, second, third, get paid out, that whole thing. It's going to be kind of fun. Pudilova is going to get faded for my lock of the night. I'm going Antonina Shevchenko for my lock of the night this week at minus 141. So we're going to lay two units on her. And I know we've done the units thing before, but we've got a whole lot of new listeners. So what that means is, let's say, for instance, you're betting an underdog plus 150 underdog. One unit, for the sake of argument, let's say it's 100 bucks. You bet $100 on the plus 150 underdog. That underdog wins. You get your $100 back and you get the 150 that's your payout. So you're going to get $250 back for your $100 bet. That's one unit and you won 
units. So, and on the flip side of that, that's where it gets interesting. Let's say you've got a minus 200 favorite and we're going to bet one unit on the minus 200 favorite. That doesn't mean we're betting $100 on the minus 200 favorite because that would only pay us back 50 bucks when that favorite won. We're laying enough to win one unit. So you're laying $200 to win $100. So technically speaking, you're betting two units on the minus 200 favorite to win one unit. That's too lengthy. (laughs) Just assume if I say I'm laying one unit on a favorite, you're laying whatever that minus number is. So if we're laying, if we're playing one unit on a minus 150 favorite, we're actually laying 1.5 units to win one unit on a 200 favorite, two units to win one unit. So in this case, where we've got a minus 141 favorite, we are going to lay 1.41 units to win one unit twice. So we're going to lay 2.82 units to win two units in this spot with Antonina Shevchenko. And we are going to laugh our way to the bank when everybody who's hammering Lucy Pudilova goes, oh shit, Shevchenko's actually really good on the feet. Well, no duh she is. That's the point. All right, we're bouncing right back up to the 170-pound division where Mickey Gall is taking on Salim Tuhari. Now, Mickey Gall is a strange, strange story in MMA. He's only 27 years old. He's 5-2, and two, facing Salim Tuhari, who's 29 years old and 10-3. and three. Now, Mickey Gall... <laughs> Uh, again, really, really weird. So he gets brought into the UFC. He's the first ever find on uh, Dana White's looking for a fight series. I'm sorry, second find. The first find was Sage Northcutt. He was the second find. He calls out CM Punk and the UFC decides to give it to him. CM Punk's never had a UFC fight. So they're like, okay, let's give this promising looking young kid the fight because he's not really UFC level, but he looks like he's got all the pieces so he could get there. Well, he demolishes CM Punk in the first round, as he should have. He's a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and just wrecks CM Punk. So then they match him up, you know, looking for a fight fighter versus looking for a fight fighter. He's a 170 pounder and Sage Northcutt, who's a much smaller 155er, moves up to take him on to see who the better one is. Sage dices him up on the feet. And he learns real quick he doesn't want to be there. So he takes him down. He's the bigger, stronger guy on the mat. He chokes Sage out. Sage has a problem with the ground game. We know that. Sage is very talented, but he's also kind of not a fighter. He's kind of a competitor. So just a bad spot for him. Fighting up a weight class against a guy whose strength is his disadvantage. Bad spot for poor Sage. And he's not in the UFC any longer because he couldn't hack it either. So then he faces Randy Brown and loses a very convincing Um, decision and that was before randy brown put it all together i know randy brown has since um ko'd brian barbarana in brutal fashion and now we are looking forward to the future of uh, randy brown but at the time randy brown was not this version of randy brown he couldn't put it together and he managed to grind out mickey gall so not a great win he wins against george sullivan First round chokes him out yet again, puts that Brazilian jiu-jitsu to work. And you know what? He's on a four-fight losing streak and no longer in the UFC either. Then Mickey Gall gets a layup. The UFC wants to give him one more fight where he can just kind of, you know, get one up over a name, really protect their investment here. Diego, the Nightmare Sanchez, and we blasted that plus 235 underdog line. Cashed in hard on my boy Diego because Mickey Gall ain't got it. Now, I know there's all kinds of stuff going on out there about he was sick. He had an infection, something like that. He was really, his kidneys shut down in the weight cut, this and that. I don't know how much stock we can put into that. Um, Mickey Gall is a talker. He's a classic talker that will backtrack as soon as things don't go his way. I don't think he's got it. I think he's another one of these cases where he's got all the skills. He's got all the physical opportunities. He's solid on the ground, but he just might not be a fighter. I don't know if he's going to put the whole game together to be a UFC fighter. And I mean, if I had the talent that Mickey Gall did, I I would love that because I could never put it together myself. And I was far lower level than Mickey Gall. So I'm not talking trash. I'm not talking shit. Um, But when it comes to breaking down these fights, I just don't think he's on the level of the UFC. And I don't know that he's going to get there. He's really only got BJJ as a weapon. 
He gasses out as the fight goes on. He doesn't really know how to manage his gas tank. He goes for broke when he sees a spot where he might be able to get a finish. And the only thing that he's done is submit people. He's got a 100% submission rate. So he really is the definition of submission or bust. If he's not going to get that sub, he's not going to win. Even though his striking has improved, even though it looks like he's taking his strength and conditioning more seriously... I just don't think that's enough. He did land a big bomb on Diego Sanchez, and I was talking to somebody about this on Twitter. That doesn't impress me enough. If you're preaching about how this is a bounce back spot for Gall, this is a good spot for Gall to really show that he's okay, he's improved, and come back off that Diego Sanchez loss with a win and get back on track. The fact that he hurt Diego Sanchez, who is one of the chinniest fighters currently in the UFC, and who is one of the oldest fighters currently in the UFC... Uh, I guess he's not the oldest at 37, but you know what I mean. He's been around since the Ultimate Fighter Season 1. He's one of the longest-running fighters in the UFC, and he's taken some of the most damage out of anybody who's still actively on the roster. Hurting that kind of a guy with a big Hail Mary, pom- uh, Hail Mary punch or a bomb doesn't do anything for me. That's not impressive to me. He's facing Salim Tuhari. Now, Salim Tuhari on the other side looks almost like a broken prospect as well. He's very impressive, gets into the UFC 10-1, and one, and he faces Worley Alves, which talk about a debut. Woof. Worley Alves is a veteran, and he's phenomenal. Uh, he's had a bit of a rough road himself, had a hard time putting it together, but he fought James Krause, Kamaru Usman, and Brian Barbarena. Much higher level of competition. And he he's getting it back on track. He's got super, super heavy hands power in his punches so there is no shame in losing to Worley Alves especially in your UFC debut because that is a tall tall order not only that he didn't get hurt he had his moments and he lost the decision now granted his second fight with Keita Nakamura maybe he should have won that one but you know what Nakamura still had some gas in the tank that was in December of 2018 so he's had about seven or eight months at this point to kind of grow and develop from that and like I said Nakamura wasn't completely shot and he's 34 and 10 he's only 35 years old he's a veteran of the sport he's got that veteran savvy he worked one over on the young kid Salim and that's eh, people want to get on him for that loss I mean Nakamura would probably bust up most of the people that Mickey Gall fought against I mean if you want to be real let's compare resumes here right (laughs) unzip pull them out measure them Salim's is way bigger. (laughs) Salim Tuhari has a much better level of competition in his two UFC fights. I really think that this is the UFC sacrificing one prospect for another. I think they are ready to cut their losses with Mickey Gall unless he can get his shit together. They have seen the writing on the wall that this kid may not be UFC caliber. I think maybe they had overhyped expectations of Salim Tuhari bringing him in here, him dropping two fights back to back. They're ready to cut their losses with him as well. So they're going to throw these two in there, let them duke it out, and it's probably a loser leaves town match, and they'll have to get some outside the UFC experience if they want to try to come back and get it done. But what we haven't done is broken down Salim Tuhari yet. Like I said, he's fought the higher level of competition in and outside the UFC. He's actually a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and he is a Polish-Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world champion. So, with Mickey Gall's biggest strength being on the mat, with Mickey Gall's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu being his one path to victory, I think Salim Tuhari is going to be able to completely stuff that. The other aspect of this is the striking. Salim Tuhari actually is relatively solid on the feet. Like I said, he had a very, very good showing against a very dangerous striker in Worley Alves, and he throws heavies. He's got bombs. He's got a 60% knockout rate. He hurts people when he lands. So if he is able to cancel out the grappling of Mickey Gall, this is going to be a striking match. And if he's able to force Gall to wrestle, defends the takedown, keeps it standing... Gall's going to get tired. Tuhari's going to start throwing. And even if Mickey Gall has improved striking, I don't think he's going to be improved to the level of Tuhari. He's shown me nothing to this point that says he'll be able to improve that far since his last fight because he showed us that he doesn't have shit in his last fight. And he's never shown us the ability to improve so far, actually. So, really, what are we expecting out of Mickey Gall? He hasn't shown us any improvement whatsoever since the very beginning. Tuhari is the better, more well-rounded fighter. 
Tuhari is a higher level of grappler than Gaul is, and at worst case, worst case scenario, he'll be able to at least match Mickey Gaul and cancel out the grappling. I think he'll be smart enough to take this fight where he knows he has the advantage and keep it standing. I expect Mil- Mickey Gaul to get KO'd in the second round again. We are going to be on Slim Tuhari, and this is one of those fancy situations where I tweet out a line and get to use it on the show because it works a little bit better for us. I tweeted out Slim Tuhari at minus 105. I saw the writing on the wall. Unfortunately, just a little too late to grab the dog money because he did open up at a decent side, uh, decent sized underdog line. We missed it. I got on the horse and I realized the writing on the wall. We got minus 105. If you got my tweet, you locked up minus 105. Good for freaking you because we killed this line movement. More money is pouring in on Slim Tuhari. And even if this bet loses, we are making... So we've got such a better line than everybody else out there because right now he's down at minus 135. I see him at minus 137. And I think the landslide of money is just going to keep coming in as people see and realize the things that we know already. I still like him at minus 130, minus 135. I think he is the rightful favorite here. I don't think Mickey Gall can hang with this kid. Hopefully you locked up the better line. If not, I would still take him. Well, that'll bring us over to the main card. The undercard, I like it. We've got a lot of solid picks, in my opinion, for the undercard. I'm looking forward to it. Again, not the biggest name value, but we should get some fun fights, and I think we've got some good value spots. We're going to head on up to the big boys. Darko Stosik takes on Kennedy Nijoku, and this is going to be a fun fight. This is going to be a banger. Now, this is one where both these guys are coming off of a loss. Darko Stosik let us down. He fought Devin Clark and lost that three-round decision and really, really disappointed me. I'm not sure if that's the kind of fighter that he really is and that's the kind of fighter he's going to be at this level or if that was just a bad fight for him. But he really looked like he was only ready to turn it up in the last five minutes and hoped he would get it done in that amount of time. He's really slow and plods forward. He's got heavy bombs. He's very, very talented when it comes to his striking because he is the protege of Mirko freaking Krokop. If he gets on top of you, he will ground and pound you to oblivion. He's got heavies. He is a little bit slow in plotting though, but he's very physically strong. One thing that is good about that though is that he kind of shells up. He's got these big thick arms and shoulders, so it's real hard to get in and touch his head around those things. Kennedy Nijoku, on the other hand, is one of these guys He's fighting out of Fortis MMA, and there's a lot of talent coming out of Fortis MMA. He's almost like a 205 young version of Francis Ngannou. Not quite to that level, but he's got the kind of heat that I'm talking about. He's putting his striking together. He's only getting better. He's improving. He made a mistake against Paul Craig. He got himself involved in the grappling a little too much, and he caught that fluke submission that we all know and love Paul Craig for at the very end of round three. Um, With only just about 30 seconds left on the clock, he got subbed by Paul Craig because he just couldn't keep it up. He is the kind of fighter who I think is going to learn very much from that kind of an experience and come back better. Not only that, Darko Stosik doesn't have that kind of a threat. As long as he can defend the takedown from Darko Stosik and not end up underneath him, this is going to be a banger on the feet. Unfortunately, I don't like the line. It's not in a spot where I can say there's value one way or the other. It's about a pick'em. He's uh, Darko Stosik is a slight favorite, minus 120, minus 130, somewhere in that range. And Kennedy Nijoku is sitting at about plus 110, plus 105. He did get up to about plus 120, and I was kind of starting to rub my hands and get a little excited and interested in Nijoku because I favor him ever so slightly in this fight, but it wasn't quite enough for me to go ahead and pull that trigger. I was honestly hoping that people were going to keep on pounding Stosik, and we'd get about plus 135, plus 140 on Nijoku. And then we could justify taking that shot that he's going to come back and improved and land a bomb on Stosik. Because the line would be where we were getting enough value. But it didn't happen. It seems like people have kind of opened their eyes. They're realizing the kind of fight that this is. And they're realizing, Stos- they're realizing Stosik didn't look that great against a guy who, while Devin Clark looked better in his fight against Stosik, again, I've said it time and time again, I can't wait to fade that dude. I just don't think he's got it. Um, he belongs a weight class down. He's fast, he's athletic, and that works for him every once in a while, but I 
I only think that's going to get him so far. So Kennedy, he's a big dude. He's going to trade heavies with Stosic. And I think one of these guys is going to sleep. So I would love to take the dog if we got a juicy number. I will keep an eye on this one if the line gets out of control. If we can get Kennedy Njoku around plus 135, something like that. I may tweet out that we're going to take a shot on this guy. We will watch for it, but at this point, we're going to have to pass. I'll also be very curious to see the uh, round props when that one comes out. I'm sure that one's going to be lined at my, at uh, the 1.5 mark, and that one might be one that we want to keep an eye on potentially going over the way Star uh, Stosic fights, you know, really shelling up in the way that both of them are coming off a loss. I think they're going to be a little tentative. This one might actually end up being one of those sloppy bangers that inches its way over that 1.5 round mark just because both these guys are really wanting to get back on track and get that win streak. Neither of them wants to get clipped by the other. They know they've got power. They'll respect one another. And we might get a juicy underdog line on that one and a half round mark because they're expecting these two to go to war. Another thing just to kind of keep an eye out on, and I may tweet more about later. At DieHardMMAPod, give me a follow on Twitter. Next up, we've got the absolute biggest favorite on the card, Scott Hot Sauce Holtzman facing Don Young Ma. And uh, this one's kind of funny, actually. Don Young Ma is actually Don Young Kim, but they confused him with the other, the good Dong Young Kim. And you can't have two fighters with the exact same name that are both Asian that people mix up on your roster, which unfortunately, because they're both, you know, Asian fighters, people were doing. So they had to change his name. He's now Dong Hyung Ma. So there's a difference there and we can separate the two of them. I'm going to be super quick on this one. Scott Holdsman is a massive favorite. He opened up minus 270 and has been steamed all the way up to minus 380. And I massively agree with that line move and all the money. There is no value on this line because realistically speaking, the line is too wide. Scott Holtzman shouldn't be that fav- big of a favorite over anybody he is good he fights out of the mma lab he's solid he's on the rise he's looking promising he's coming off a loss all these things are going to be motivational factors and really solid towards him i don't see a path to victory victory for dong young ma Uh, maestro is a decent fighter but nothing that he does is going to hurt scott holtzman scott will be able to control this fight basically everywhere when you pull their stats up scott holtzman is better on every single level Scott's going to control this fight. Scott's going to win this fight. I don't know that he's going to finish it because uh, Ma is is a tough guy. He really is. And I hope I'm wrong. I would love to see an upset in this spot. I'm not touching it. I don't suggest that you touch it. But I can't say to take a shot on the dog because I don't see how Dong gets it done besides the banana peel slip and Holtzman falls and cracks his chin somehow. Let's move on and save that time where it's better used. All right, we are headed back to middleweight where Trevin the Problem Giles takes on Gerald GM3 Mearshart. This is a fun one. Trevin Giles is named the Problem, and that is a great name for him. He is gonna be a problem. Now, he's 11 and 1 fighting out of elite Texas Elite MMA. And he's coming off the first ever loss of his career to Zach Cummings in May of 2019. And that's one where we were ever so close to cashing in on Zach Cummings as a nice, fat, juicy dog. We decided to stay off of it. And that's one where uh, I was really glad we stayed off of it, even though Zach Cummings won, because he really kind of got messed up. I felt like Trevin Giles did everything he needed to to win that fight. And then he got caught in the very last minute of the third round and gave that choke up. He really stepped heavy into a big hook that comes coming through. It was kind of the perfect storm. His athleticism worked against him because he kind of dove headlong into a big bomb that Cummings was throwing. Not something I expect to happen often or again anytime soon. He has excellent range control. One thing he does that I really like is he kind of paws with his lead the hand to find the range and the distance. The other thing he does that I like is woo! <laughs> he likes to get into it with the crowd. He howls basically throughout every single fight. He just loves being in there. I love the positivity. I love the effort and I love that he gets into it with people. He will be underneath somebody defending against ground and pound and woo at the guy so he gets the crowd going. He's got really fast hands. He's got powerful, powerful bombs in those fists of his. 
good solid boxing. He's elusive. He circles well. He's got good footwork. He's actually got really solid takedowns. And once he gets it to the ground, he's got good ground and pound and a very heavy top game. He's got good Brazilian Jiu Jitsu defense off of his back and he stays safe. He keeps everything nice, solid and tight. He doesn't really overexpose himself where he's going to be in danger of having an arm snapped off. He does give up some guard passes, but it's kind of the sacrifice. He kind of gives that up to protect himself. Even if he gives up that guard pass, he's not opening himself up to be submitted when that happens, and he looks to work himself back to guard or get back to his feet. Not a bad trade-off. Now, he did just come back after taking two years off from getting married, having a baby, and joining the police academy. So he took two years off, but it was all for good things. And taking that time off to join the police academy, you know he was working, you know he was in shape that whole time. So... Maybe he wasn't peak level training at that point, but he wasn't sitting around getting fat. He was still getting ready for the police department. So he comes back, he loses to Zach Cummings, and even though he looked really good in that fight, honestly, I feel like he had a little bit of ring rust. He's got a 75% takedown defense rating. He's going to be very, very hard to get to the ground. He's got 61% striking accuracy, and he unloads 6.13, 6.13 significant strikes per minute on his opponents, and he combines that with a phenomenal 71% striking defense. Now, something that you may learn if you listen to my guy, um, the MMA by the Numbers podcast, shout out to Jason Chandel. Love that guy. Love your show. Usually you'll see somebody equal right around 100%, right? So if you've got 40% striking accuracy, you probably have about 60% striking defense. That's kind of what you generally see with your average fighters. Maybe a little bit above that when you get to sort of the better fighters. This dude's got a 61% accuracy and a 71% striking defense. Those numbers are phenomenal. That puts him in the elite when it comes to percentages. I know he's got a relatively low level of UFC competition. He's only got three UFC fights, but those are still very impressive numbers for him to get started with. Now, Gerald Mearshart, he's 31. He is 28 and 11, and he's been around the sport for a while. The thing that jumps off the page about him is his 20 submissions. Out of his 28 wins, 20 of those have come by submission. He's got a 71% submission game. He's got a really good bottom game. He doesn't mind being underneath his opponents. He flows well. He uses his butterfly hooks well. He sweeps. He does have that offensive submission game quite obviously when you've locked up 20 of them at the pro level. Um, He does throw heavies though. He gets on his feet and he tries to force the grappling exchanges. Again, almost like that Damian Meyer reference I used not too long ago. He throws bombs because he doesn't mind if he ends up on the bottom. Now, that's going to not work for him in this case, though, and I hope he sticks to that normal, usual game plan, because he is so hittable. He's very, very open for counters, and when you've got a guy with the speed of Trevin Giles, he's gonna find those counters. He absorbs 3.56 significant strikes per minute on average, and he's only got a 46% striking defense. He's only got a 44% takedown accuracy. So for a guy who likes to go for the submissions, for a guy who needs this thing to be on the ground for him to have his most consistent path to victory, kind of has a hard time getting it there. And when you're taking on an opponent whose uh, takedown defense is through the freaking roof at 75%, I don't know that you're going to get there. I, I'm i all about Trevin Giles in this spot. I think he's going to shake off the ring rust. I think that last fight where he dropped his first loss, I think that was the one where he was a little bit rusty, he made a mistake, he got in there too deep, and he paid for it. It happens. I think he's going to unload on GM3. Mearshart is, he's on a back-to-back losing streak against Kevin Holland and Jack Hermanson. Got choked out in the first round by Jack Hermanson. Hermanson's on a tear. You can't really fault him too much for that. But his split decision loss to Kevin Holland, that was a grappling heavy match that kind of could have gone either way. They were just kind of fumbling all over one another. It was basically a submission only jujitsu match in an MMA cage. Neither of them was going to, uh, do anything besides get the submission. And it was only back in 2017 that he got KO'd by Tiago Santos. While my gut tells me that Trevin Giles ends this thing by KO, I'm not entirely certain that that'll happen just because Mearshart has proven 
relative toughness. The only guy that he got KO'd by was Tiago Santos, and Tiago Santos KOs everybody. That's his lone UFC loss by KO. So even though he's been knocked out, it was by a murderous power puncher. I see the opportunity. I see the counters. I see the spots. I think Giles has the fast hands. I think Giles knocks him out. But I don't want to lose a unit because Giles dominates this guy for three rounds, and we took the prop. So once again, very undiehard MMA fashion, we are going to lay the wood. The line opened up minus 145 with Chevin Giles as a favorite, the comeback on Gerald Mearchart. We have a reverse line movement spot here, ladies and gentlemen, that we are going to be on the same side of. 55% of the money has come in on Mearshart, and he is a bigger favorite. He is now sitting at plus 150. Trevin Giles is minus 170 across the board. So what we're going to do to bring this price down is our usual trick. There's one other favorite on the board that I like just about in the same spot that we are going to parlay him with. So put a pin in it. Trevin Giles, minus 170, is going to get parlayed. Let's roll on to the next fight. Next up, we have got Joaquim Silva versus Nazrat Hackprest. We are going to the UFC's lightweight division for an absolute banger. Joaquim Silva, Neto BJJ, is 30 years old, in his prime, 11 and 1. The flip side of this is Nazrat Hackprest, who's only 23 years old, 10 and 2. And oh, this is going to be a fun one. Now, Joaquim Silva, he's got a solid solid chin he got rocked a couple times in his last fight and he was able to bite down and bear through it his last win was against jared gordon and gordon unloaded on him they had an absolute war they went back and forth hard for a good two and a half rounds before gordon finally went down in the end of round three he he's got a really good offense with good uppercuts. He works the body from the clinch. He's got good defense from the bottom. He also uses butterfly hooks very, very well, I noticed. He's athletic. He's kind of a brick shit house. He's one of these little short muscle type dudes. And he throws flying knees. He explodes. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. One thing he likes to do is he works knees to the body. He throws those uppercuts to the body and the chin. So you kind of have a hard time seeing which one it's going to land on. Um, he does throw good offensive kicks and like I said he got hurt against Jordan a couple times but he was able to bite down and bear through it I am a little concerned with the amount of damage that he took in that one though he did take time off that was December of 2018 so about eight months that's kind of what you're looking for he took a decent amount of time off to recover so I don't know that we have to really worry about the chin issue but he did take multiple concussive blows over and over and over we saw what that fight did to Jared Gordon he didn't look so hot coming back from that fight now granted he came back sooner but there's a potential that Silva is gonna be a little shaky coming back from that he does throw 4.4 significant strikes per minute and he absorbs 4.5 significant strikes per minute so he does tend to brawl and he does tend to be on the bad side of that brawl he's only got a 57 percent striking defense and he's got a 64 percent takedown defense so that's not so bad the biggest stat here, though, is that he's willing to trade heavies, and he's usually on the wrong side of it. Nazrat Hakparast, on the other hand, like I said, only 23 years old. The sky is the limit for this guy. He trains out of TriStar Gym up in Canada with guys like GSP. Um, now we've got the Motown Phenom that moved up there. Really good coaching staff. He's got the right people around him. They call him Baby Gastelum. It's incredible how much this guy looks and fights like Kelvin Gastelum. How are they not related? I really don't understand. It's really funny. But he's got really great footwork. He's got great speed. He parries hands really well. That's something that I think is uh, very important to note. He's got good, um, his eyes are good. That's something that you can really tell. When a fighter's got really fast hands and they can see your, your punches coming and just swat them kind of out of the way repeatedly. Not every once in a while, but all the time he does this. He's got really, really sharp eyes. It's like he's right out of Dragon Ball Z or something. He's going to punch your hand after you already threw the punch because he knows where it's going. He throws heavies. He throws bombs. This dude, he's got wide looping hooks for how short he is. He's got these really long gorilla arms. And what that does is he's able to kind of move in and he throws these looping shots where 
you don't know where they're coming from. You know a punch is coming. You don't know if it's a hook at head level. You don't know if it's kind of an overhand. You don't know if it's going to be kind of a shovely upper hook. You don't know what it's going to be because he's got these long arms that you really, it gets out of your range of vision. It's kind of awesome. He's kind of the perfect storm. He also works the body well. He throws hard knees to the body, hard explosive kicks to the body, and he's really got a solid killer instinct. When you show just ever so slightly the crack in your armor when he hurts you, when he sees that, he goes for broke, and in a smart way, not in a gas out Mickey Gall kind of way. He knows how to end a fight, and he will swarm you once he sees that you're in any way weak. Now, he puts out a phenomenal 5.42 significant strikes per minute. And he's one of these other ones who's got a good solid ratio. He only absorbs 3.27 significant strikes per minute. He's got a 75% striking defense. So with these two fighters, they're going to go at it toe to toe. Joaquim is willing to trade bombs with people. However, Joaquim gets outlanded when it comes to power strikes with all of his opponents Whereas uh, Nazrat Hakparast massively unloads and outlands his opponent. And then he's got a 78% takedown defense to boot. So with Silva coming in here, yes, he may have an advantage on the ground. But I don't know if he can get it there because Nazrat has been able to hold off the takedowns incredibly well for such a young fighter. I really think this kid is eventually going to have a belt around his waist. It's just going to be a matter of time. Remember that parlay that I mentioned? Yeah, we're closing it right away. Nazrat is about a minus 245 favorite. However, we can snag him right now at Pinnacle at minus 229. This is another one where it's not quite a reverse line movement situation. The line hasn't budged. 62% of the money has come in on Joaquim Silva, and that line is flat. He opened up at plus 205. You can still get plus 205 over at five times. He's down to plus 190, plus 195, plus 200. He's still in that ballpark. Um, it hasn't budged. And that's because the smart people are all still betting on Nazrat Hackprast. So we are going to parlay Trevin Giles with Nazrat Hackprast. I think both of these guys have the ability to get it done by knockout. I think they have the right opponents where they could get it done by knockout. However, there is enough risk. They are facing tougher opponents where they might grind out a three-round decision if one of them drops the ball. Rather than risking a total of about four units to lay the wood with these two favorites, we are going to drop our risk-reward ratio. We are going to risk one unit on them instead. And that one unit is going to get us plus 128. So we are going to risk one unit on this parlay to win 1.28 units rather than risking that massive four units and burying ourselves if one or both of these guys get the upset. I love this parlay. We've been doing this a lot lately, and arguably that's kind of been our most profitable move is taking these solid favorites that I'm very confident in and then parlaying them, keeping that risk management down. I like it. Parlay. Let's go. All right, diehards, we have made it to the co-main event of the evening where we have a battle of the dinosaurs. Jim, A10, A10, really? Jim's fight name is A, did anybody else know Jim's fight name was A10? I didn't know Jim Miller's fight name was A10. Okay, Jim Miller's taking on Clay Guida, two of the longest running UFC fighters that we have to offer. Jim Miller is 35 years old. Clay Guida is 37. Jim is 30 and 13 and Clay Guida is 35 and 18. Holy cow, these guys have some experience under their belts. And I'm going to try to keep this one brief. I don't want to spend a whole long time on it because we are really just going to avoid this fight. The line hasn't really budged. Jim Miller opened up at about minus 175, the comeback on Clay Guida at plus 155. And Jim is a slightly bigger favorite. Most of the money's come in on Miller, and I agree with that. I've been talking with some people about this one, and I know some people think there's going to be value on Clay Guida being this big of a dog. He's a strong wrestler. He has had a good showing in his last couple fights. He is 3-1 and one in his last four, only with the submission loss to Charles Oliveira, who, let's face it, everyone gets submitted by Oliveira. Jim Miller just got submitted by Oliveira. Um, Jim was on a four-fight skid, but those are against Dustin Poirier, Anthony Pettis, Francisco Trinaldo, and Dan freaking Hooker. So really, the cream of the crop in some of this. Dustin Poirier has a title. Dan Hooker is a future title contender. Trinaldo is a 
brick shit house. Anthony Pettis just moved up to one freaking 70 and is knocking people with flying stuff. So, I mean, really, there's no shame in any of those four losses. He comes back, subs Alex White. Okay, that was a layup. Alex White's nothing. He loses by submission to Oliveira. Okay, everyone loses by submission to Charles Oliveira. So no shame there either. Well, then he gets another layup with Jason Gonzalez. So really, the only people that Miller has beat are people who are not great, right? So his losses are to great guys, and he gets dominated. His wins are against low-level guys where he dominates. It's a very strange spot where we're going, Jim Miller is on the twilight of his career, but we don't really know where to gauge him. Is he a gatekeeper? Is he middle to low tier? Could he still be a challenger? We're not sure because his win-loss ratio just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He's fighting Lyme disease, so we know that he's always going to be struggling with that, and that's going to be a bit of an issue for him. His striking is still relatively solid, and he can still throw with the best of them. I think he could catch a guy like Guida and back him up, but Guida's known well for his chin. The biggest thing Jim's got going for him is his submission offense, and really the biggest thing here is Clay Guida has suspect submission defense. He's a wrestler. He uses his awkward movement to throw bombs. I don't think he's going to hit hard enough to KO Jim Miller. I just don't think he can. The only guy that did that was Dan Hooker, and... Dan Hooker is going to be way better than Clay Guida is at this point. And Clay Guida didn't look great against BJ Penn. The fact that Clay Guida has been submitted by nine times, his nine of his losses are by submission. He has a 50% sub rate. I think this thing's going to hit the ground. I think Jim Miller submits Clay Guida, but I'm not putting my money anywhere near it. I'm not going to lay that kind of wood with an aging veteran, especially when he's fighting another aging veteran who realistically is on a better win streak than he is. We don't know where these two guys are at. It could get sloppy. They both could show signs of their age and really just kind of flop and roll all over each other when this one gets going. I don't like it. I don't like that it's the co-main event. I would watch this fight, move it down a spot, put some more younger, exciting fighters up a little bit higher. I don't get why it's the co-main event, even though I'm fans of both of these guys. Uh, Let's just kind of avoid it and move on. We are there. We have made it, diehards, the main event of the evening, and this is a fun one. We have got Colby, Chaos Covington, 14 and 1, the most hated man in the UFC besides maybe Greg Hardy. We have Robbie Lawler, fan favorite, beloved by everyone, UFC veteran, 28 and 13, former welterweight champion versus former welterweight interim champion. Massive contrast of styles here. Robbie Lawler is a physical monster and a brawler. Colby Covington is kind of a finesse wrestler who is very much 170 pounds Khabib. He sticks to people like glue. He chain grapples your face off. Colby is doing nothing but win right now. Like I said, he's 14 and one. He's riding a six fight win streak and that level of competition is steadily rising up. However, I do believe we've reached the apex of it. Damian Maya, Rafael Dos Anjos, those are the two most recent wins that Colby has, and while those are impressive, I think Robbie is better and more talented than both of them. Yes, I know that sounds weird, because Robbie just lost to RDA, but I'll get there. RDA is a well-rounded fighter. We know about him, we've talked about him, we've broken down a couple of his fights recently, and I'm a big fan of his. When he fought Robbie Lawler at 170, it really looked like he completely dominated Robbie Lawler bell to bell, but... When you go back and you rewatch that fight, all of us have the mental note that RDA wrecked Robbie Lawler for five full rounds. Go back and rewatch it. Robbie hurts his knee in like the second round. And when that happens, it's almost like what happened in the John Jones Tiago fight where he kind of puts his weight on it and goes, oh, you can see it on his face. You can see him wobble. Something was wrong. He couldn't put any weight on that leg. So rather than hunting down Rafael Dos Anjos like he normally would, He backed up and he put his back against the cage. So there's been some weird stuff happening in the life of Robbie Lawler right now. He's 37 years old. So yes, I know we're creeping ever closer to that dangerous 40 year old number that I tried to avoid, but he was the champion in 2016. He got brutally knocked out by Tyrone Woodley. Before that though, he put on some stellar performances over guys like Johnny Hendricks, Roy McDonald, and Carlos Condit. That Roy McDonald fight is a fight of the century type of fight. So he rebounds from his brutal knockout loss with a win over Donald Cowboy Cerrone, and that was a good fight. 
and then he faces Rafael Dos Anjos, and that fight was very competitive up until the point that he hurt his knee. It became very apparent that he was just trying to... He didn't want to give up. He's a warrior. He's a, he's a fighter that's just never going to quit, which is a good reason to bet on him. But Rafael Dos Anjos was hammering him, and he was doing everything he could to still be in that fight on one leg, using the cage to keep himself up. We can't really hold that too much against him. Now, he takes a little bit of time off, right? Takes about two years off, year and a half, and everyone's wondering what he's going to look like. How's he going to come back? Probably the end of his career. We know we're not going to get peak Robbie Lawler. And then he comes out to face Ben Askren, and oh my god, we have never seen him in better shape than when he was going to fight Ben Askren. He was as ripped and as muscular as he has ever been with veins popping out of his freaking head. His veins had veins. I can't believe the shape he was in for the Ben Askren fight. But that fight ended in controversy. Another really weird situation. Now here, this is the thing that... I'm going to have to bet Robbie Lawler, guys. I'm going to have to bet Robbie Lawler. I can't respect myself in the morning if I don't bet Robbie Lawler. We can get him at plus 195 right now, and I'm going to lock that up because I think money's starting to come in on... Yes, money is starting to come in on Robbie Lawler. That line is crashing. So Colby opened up minus 240, and... 61% of the money has come in on Lawler, pushing his plus 200 down to plus 195, plus 185, plus 180. It is crashing as we speak. So I'm going to lock up that plus 195. Go get the plus 195 on Robbie Lawler. He's the best fighter Colby Covington has ever faced. He's a completely different animal, too. Colby Covington overwhelms his opponents. He gets them down. He gets them against the fence. He wears on them. And he just has a never-ending gas tank. So the person who put up the biggest fight was Rafael Dos Anjos. And Dos Anjos landed some shots. Dos Anjos was able to work up against the cage. He was able to defend the takedown. And he was landing knees and elbows from inside the clinch against the cage on Covington. In rounds four and round five, Covington started having a harder time with the takedown. RDA was able to actually get some striking going at range in the center of the cage in the later rounds. And I will be honest with you, I think Robbie can do that exact same thing. Except when Robbie lands those shots, it's going to hurt. Robbie Lawler is a true, filled-out, lifelong 170-pound fighter. Rafael Dos Anjos is a 155-er who got a little too big for the division and had to move up. Robbie Lawler throws bombs. What he did to Ben Askren was ridiculous. Ben Askren came in, went for the takedown. Robbie was physically too powerful for him to get there he shucked him off and then threw him on his head now colby covington has absorbed some decent shots from damian maya and rafael dos anjos let me repeat that damian maya and rafael dos anjos we don't know if he can take a shot from robbie lawler i know he's got a good chin i know he's a good solid fighter and if this line was a pick em, i probably bet colby covington But there is value on Robbie Lawler. He's got all the skills that it would take to defend this kind of a game plan. And if Colby Covington comes out with the same kind of game plan he had against RDA, which let's face it, that's been the game plan of his entire career, I think RDA showed us how you combat that. And I think Robbie Lawler will be able to implement that game plan only better. Robbie's also one of those fighters that gets better as this fight goes on. So you say... If it's the under, it's Robbie Lawler. If it's the over, it's Covington. But that's not necessarily true in this spot because Robbie will also turn it up as this fight goes on. If Colby slows any signs of weakness, if he takes one step backwards, if he slows down even a little, Robbie will punish him for it. And if he comes in and Robbie throws a check knee and clips him on the chin, I don't know how Colby's going to react. I don't think he's ever been hit with a shot as powerful as something like a knee from Robbie Lawler. So we know he's walked through other guys. Can he walk through Robbie Lawler's knee? Not a lot of people can walk through Robbie Lawler's knee. So this one's going to be interesting. This one's going to get hairy. Here's a dog I like. Here's a dog I will take a shot on. We're going to end our night with the biggest dog that I like on the card. Robbie Lawler at plus 195. Let's freaking get it. Alright diehards, let's recap those picks. We're going to kick our night off. We are going to take Claudio Silva inside the distance at minus 160. We are going to roll with our lady Mara Borella at minus 165. We will lay the wood with her. 
We're gonna take Matt Danger Zone Schnell. It's minus 105. We're going to take the bounce back on Antonina Shevchenko. Minus 141, we're gonna lay not one, but two units on that play because I am that confident. We are going to take Salim Tuhari at minus 105 to wreck Mickey Gall and put him away. He will not be in the UFC after this weekend. We have a parlay where we're gonna lay it with the favorites, Trevin Giles and Nazrat Hackparast for plus 128. We're gonna close the night with our big juicy dog looking for that score at the end of the evening. Ruthless Robbie Lawler, plus 195. Thank you all so much for the love. Thank you for the support. Retweet, share the show, subscribe on YouTube. Give me a five-star rating. Reach out to me at Die Hard MMA Podcast on Twitter. Let's roll.